We go to our Rima this morning, and we are in Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Here we go. We are at the parable of the ten virgins. That's an important parable, isn't it? And verse 25. I'm sorry, chapter 25. Verse 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming. They all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oils. oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us and you. Or both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourself. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Wow. Amen. Now, the end of this, look at this, end of the parable here states, verse 13 states, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. The day or the hour, the bridegroom will return. Now, everybody knows this, everybody knows this is one of the key identities of the Lord of the Second Advent that he is the bridegroom. The others being that he is a king, he establishes a kingship, a kingdom, and also he's a judge. He will judge wickedness and evil. But th the third identity of the Lord of Second Advent is that of bridegroom. And Jesus is talking about this. <laughs> 2,000 years ago, he will return as the bridegroom. Okay? There's also a parallel with Ephesians chapter 6, excuse me, chapter 5, where he relates uh, the church, okay? He relates the church or the believers uh, as the bride or as the bride of Christ that is then waiting for the bridegroom. No, 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 stay there, baby. No, 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 okay, okay, okay. okay. All right. So the bridegroom is one of the primary identities of Christ. One of the primary identities of Christ. Now it's interesting because there is a call. Notice here in verse 6, at midnight the cry rang out. Here's a bridegroom, come out to meet him. There is a call to meet the bridegroom. Notice that he didn't just appear with great flashes and thunder. But somebody else calls out and testifies on his behalf. Isn't that interesting? There's a testifying of the bridegroom to the brides. Okay. Then all the virgins wake up, trim their lamps. So they all heard, he's coming, he's coming. They all get up and start rushing around. And f five of them here, Recognize that they do not have oil in their lamps. Or, in other words, that they're not ready to make the journey to meet the bridegroom. They're not ready. They haven't prepared for the journey in advance. Okay? They have not prepared in advance to meet the bridegroom. And so thus, in their panic state, they're trying to go buy new oil, etc. 
They're trying to go fill up their lamps. And it's in that moment, it's in that moment where the bridegroom comes and he enters the house. And only five of the virgins enter in. Now, this is interesting because if you are a Bible-believing Christian, you have to believe that when Jesus returns, he will have five wives. Because these virgins are not there to just be servants. The virgins are there to meet what? The bridegroom and become what? The bride. So we know that the bride of Christ, the bride of Christ is, plur is a plurality. Plurality. It will not be a single bride. It is a plurality of brides. Okay. If you're a Bible-believing Christian, we have to believe that there will be multiple wives, multiple brides to Christ. Again, these brides are not just virgins that just hang around. They will be wives to Christ. They will be wed to him, especially in Revelation, uh, the book of Revelations, we see the marriage feast of the Lamb, where he what? Meets his brides and weds them. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> Christ the second advent has multiple brides. <clears throat> There were more than, than more of them were preparing, or ten of them were preparing, but five of them were able to enter in. The Bible says the bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? That's right there in verse five. The bridegroom was a long time coming. So remember, eschatologically. Okay, Paul was an eschatological teacher. He was preaching the imminent return of Christ. That Christ would come back in the first century, right away, right away, right away in a couple of years. Many believe that the, 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 the uh, Antichrist, that is referred to by John the Revelator, is Nero, it is talking about the emperor uh, in the... What is that? What is it? The first century, right after yes. Christ? Yes. That is talking about um, destroying the temple and etc. That is ruling as a tyrant and that is persecuting Christians, you name it. So most of the most of the believers in the early church believe that Christ's return was imminent. They believed that he would come immediately. And they believed the signs and wonders had already happened. They believed the Roman Empire. They believed that Nero was the emperor that was persecuting and killing Christians, which he was. They believed that he had the mark of the beast and that he had a, it was a number of a number, it was a number of a man, 666, which they believed was Nero. He ruled from 54 to 68 AD. 54 to 68 AD. And then they would also see the fall of the temple two years after his passing, or as he stopped ruling. So there was a lot of things going on in the early church, but they believed that Christ would be coming, imminent, that he, would, he rose from the dead, and that he ascended to heaven, but they, they believed that he would come very quickly. Remember, at that time, they did not have a, a canonized Bible. Okay, but the early church, we know, remember, when we look back in history, we sometimes see these folks as dehumanized sort of mythical creatures or figures. We have to understand that these people were people, just like you and me, they were people. They maybe had different clothes, they maybe had different shelters. But they were people just like exactly the same. They had the same IQ, 
They had the same, you know, uh, heart beating. The, these people were exactly like us, but basically be, us being planted, subplanted into a place 2,000 years ago near Jerusalem. And they believed that the Christ's coming was imminent. And they believed that all the signs and wonders that they heard about or that were real to them, as in the scripture, were being fulfilled. Okay. In verse 5, however, the bridegroom, it says the bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Isn't this interesting? Isn't this, doesn't this describe the body of Christ right here? The early community was on fire. They were ready for his imminent coming. 2,000 years later, the body of Christ is so lackadaisical, so drowsy. I would say now more and more, it's, it's starting to feel that these are, the, these are the last days where in which Christ will come back. But it has been a long time coming. And there have been many times where they said, oh, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. Probably every generation said that. But they all became drowsy and fell asleep, you see. All became drowsy and fell asleep. Five of them were foolish. Five were wise. Look at that. They were wise. This wisdom is... Uh, here we go. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. So the wise ones see something that the, other, the foolish ones did not see. The wise ones prepared not only oil in the lamps, but also jars to carry it. In here, the wisdom is referring, referring to the preparation of the oil, which, of course, biblically is not only for lamps, but is also for anointing. Messiah being, meaning the anointed one. They're preparing the oil in jars along with their lamps. Isn't that interesting? Why? They knew that the night would only be 12 hours maximum, eight hours. But they prepared oil in excess. They knew the night is a standard period of time. Let's say eight to ten hours, whatever. You know, the morning does come. But they prepared not only oil in their lamps, but they also prepared oil in jars. So that they would make it through the night. And when they hear the call, what would they do? They would go out to greet him. They would go out to greet him. No, that's interesting because the Lord is the light of the world. Metaphorically, they wouldn't need lamps to see him because many of the body of Christ you know, uh, press towards the scriptures in Revelation where it says he will come on the clouds with lightning and thunder. It would be very visible. But look in this parable. He comes in the night. He comes hidden in the night. He's hiding. He's hidden in the night. He's not coming with peals of thunder and lightning. Now, there is a voice. There's a voice. The midnight cry that rings out. Here's a bridegroom come out to meet him, but it doesn't come from the natural world. Isn't that interesting? It comes from the testimony of somebody. But notice again, the Bible says he comes as a thief in the night. 
He comes as a thief in the night. And again, the parable of ten virgins, we see he comes in the night. Where people can't see, they can't recognize And if their hearts and if their minds and if they are not in the modality of preparation, you see, they will not be able to see him. Unlike many people in the body of Christ, I would say the majority of people in the body of Christ are told that when he returns, he will come in peals of lightning and come in the clouds and the whole world. I, I have seen almost all biblical prophecy teachers teaching about the book of Revelation, that everybody will know when Jesus returns because he will come on clouds and there'll be lightning and there'll be the trumpet of the angels and the angel, uh, archangel Michael. There will be trumpet sounds. Now remember, in the, by the time the, camp, the Bible was canonized in the 4th century, Council of Nicaea, ever since that, every single generation, Christians have believed the Lord was coming in their generation. And the majority thought that he would come with the peals of lightning, the trumpet blasts, all this kind of thing, because the book of Revelation seems to say that. But here in the parable of ten virgins, at that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins, who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Isn't that interesting? That he comes in the night. Now, when we look at this in the kingdom perspective, or a national perspective, it says the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins. The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins. The nations, the nation will be like, the nation of the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamp, went out to meet the bridegroom. But five of them were foolish. Five of them didn't make it in with the bridegroom. Some of the kingdoms, some of the states, some of the nations, some of the population didn't make it in. Ooh, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Now, it's interesting that he said, that the Bible said, the kingdom of heaven is like the ten virgins. Like the ten. Five of them fall away. He didn't say the kingdom of heaven is like the five virgins who made it in. Ooh, isn't that interesting? He said, the Bible said the kingdom of heaven is like the ten virgins, of which five fall away. Isn't that interesting on a national level? On the national level, in an actual kingdom of God, there are those who are in the kingdom, so to speak, but they fall away. They don't get to enter in and to reap the fruit of the kingdom of heaven. Even though the Bible likens the ones also that fall away as part of the kingdom of heaven, they don't get to experience the bridegroom. They don't become the bride to the bridegroom or the bride's, one of the bride's to the bridegroom. This is why if we believe the Bible, we can't just believe in the bride of Christ. We have to believe in the brides of Christ. They also show 
that the kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of heaven is referring to the ten virgins. So it's not the kingdom of heaven is not like one bride that is marrying Christ. It is like ten brides, ten women that are preparing to marry Christ. And this is marry Christ. The word here is specifically bride and bridegroom, which is a marriage relationship, which is what? A sexual relationship, an intimate relationship. A, a relationship where the bridegroom will exchange his seed with the wombs of the bride, z, bride, z, not just bride. Half of them will fall away and reject him or will be ill prepared, let's say, will have not taken it seriously, and they will not receive the bridegroom's seed. Or the bridegroom, of which the most important part is the seed, because the, through that comes the children <clears throat> that are birthed through the consummation of marriage. And the body of Christ doesn't like to talk about it, but sexuality. Did you know that you were born because mommy and daddy had sex? Did you know that you're watching this broadcast because your mommy and daddy had sex? <laughs> oh, Lord. The bridegroom is a specific term. The bride is a specific term. They're in a covenant of marriage where in which they will exchange sexuality. It is a specific relationship. It's not a relationship between... Um, friends, siblings, co-workers, teacher and student, etc., you name it. It is a specific relationship. Bride, groom, and bride. Now remember, these are the days 2,000 years ago Jewish tradition where the bridegroom provided for his bride, remember. It used to be the man provided for the bride. It used to be that the man had to provide for the wife. So they are marrying their provider. And he has riches and he has resources and he has wealth to provide for five brides. Ten brides could have Ten brides could have gone in. Five were unprepared. So on the national level, you want to look at a national level, we can see that about 50 50 percent of the people uh, will start leaning towards political Satanism. Centralized power, centralized governance. Single women having the highest category, percentage chance, double the time of single men, double the st statistics of single men to vote, vote political Satanist or communist, socialist, fascist, you name it. All the same system. Centralized government, Centralized power, immoral, immorality. In terms of using government to steal from people and murder and kill and gather resources. But notice how those will fall away and they will not be able to enter into the intimate relationship with the kingdom of heaven. In the same way that we may have people that live in America, but are 50% now socialist. They lost the intimate connection to the founding fathers and the intimate connection to what it means to be American an intimate connection to what it means to be 
to have the Constitution and what it means to be someone who is protected by the Constitution. They lost an intimate connection. They don't know what it means to America and American. In fact, they become anti-American and hateful of America. Trying to destroy it. Which you can see not only with radical groups like Antifa, but the general public that, is, that they are trying to brainwash to believe such things. So the foolish ones do have the lamps. They have the image of light. <clears throat> they have the accoutrement that will produce light, but they don't have the fuel which is necessary for that light to be sparked into flame. They don't take enough. Their fuel runs out. Ooh, 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 see? The fuel runs out. The fuel runs out. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Jesus said that we are supposed to be as lights on top of the hilltop, or hilltop lights. You know, because we are, quote, children of the light. So we're supposed to be children of the light and be, supposed to be like lights on the hilltop. But if we don't have enough fuel, the lights go out, folks. And that's why he says, come to me and feed. Feed. What is feeding? Fuel is feeding for the fire. Feeding for the light. The bread of which I give to you, you shall never go hungry again. The water of which I give to you, you shall never thirst again. <clears throat> we go feed on the word. Feed on the relationship that we have with Christ. We feed on that. We feed on the word. We receive fuel. What is food? It's fuel. What is fuel for a lamp? Oil. It's fuel. It's food. In order for the light of the world to be shining through us and for us to be lights on the hilltop, we have to have fuel. We have to be collecting fuel. We have to be, at, fuel is not going to just be given to us. We have to eat it. We have to seek it. We have to pursue it. We have to have an extra bundle, so to speak, an extra jar of it. We have to maintain whether or not, we have to know whether or not we're going empty or whether or not we're going full. We have to be able to sense when we're going low on fuel. How many times have we go on faith, just go on faith, go on faith, and we burn out? What does that, oh, that, that mean? That's, that's actually the meaning, burning out. We're not feeding the fire with the fuel. We're just trying to go on what we had. We're not feeding on the word, feeding on the fuel to keep the light going. Notice that the light here is not only a symbolic representation of Christ, but it symbolizes the welcoming heart that is of the Virgin, that is welcoming Christ, that is prepared, but also desires Him and welcomes Him. It's like a welcoming party too, right? When He arrives, they have to stand there with the lamps. Because obviously He's the light of the world. He's going to come with a lot of lamps. He's going to come with a lot of light. When He comes, He's going to be, and he's, everybody knows where He's at. They're going to see Him. They're going to know He who who he is, even though he comes in the night. The ten virgins know that, I mean, he's going to, they're going to know who he is when he comes. 
but it's almost like a welcoming party, a welcoming uh, brigade, a welcoming, um, how do you call it? Troop. So your light doesn't only shed light into the darkness, it identifies you as one who is in Christ. So it's, it's, another, it's, a, it's another identity factor that Christ can see you and he can identify you as being one who is seeking him and loving him. In other words, he can see his light in you, which then identifies you as his. Isn't that interesting that the light that Christ puts in us becomes an identifying factor for which he can recognize us as well, separate from the world and separate from the darkness and separate from those who did not prepare the oil or the fuel. In other words, when we pay attention to our relationship with Christ and we feed on the word, we feed the fuel to the fire, Christ can see us. He can identify us in the dark. He can be what? Drawn to us and what? Choose us. Ooh, isn't that interesting? It's not only, the light is not only there to show everybody else like a beacon of hope on a hilltop. It's there also for Christ to see us and recognize who we are. Isn't that interesting? Wow, that's very interesting, isn't it? That's very interesting. Matthew 5.14. 5, there it is. So in verse 6, midnight, the cry rings out. There is a cry. There is a call. Look at this. All the virgins wake up. So all the virgins hear of the call. And the first thing they do is hurry up and trim their lamps. Because they want to extend the life of the land. They're trimming it because if you have too long of a wick, the fire gets bigger and it sucks up more fuel. So they're trimming those lamps so that the wick is smaller, so at least it will last. The foolish one said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. See, that's why they're trimming this. No, they replied, there may be not enough for both of us. Go and buy, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourself in the middle of the night. See how much of an impossible proposition that was? In the middle of the night, who's going to be selling oil? And they go. They listen to that. They go to try to buy the oil. Who are those who are selling oil? Well, oil is the fuel. Oil is the fuel for the lamps. Who will be the ones that are se selling or um, peddling or who are making their uh, living on oil, which is the fuel for the lamps? Well, it would be the pastors, wouldn't it? It would be the churches, wouldn't it? Because the churches make their living by metaphorically selling oil, or that is fuel for our relationship with Christ. Fuel. For the light of the for, for the light, which is the light of the world. Right? Churches teach on Christ. Churches teach on the word, our faith comes by hearing the word of God. They are the ones preaching the word of God. It's not Satanists that are preaching the word of God. They're not the ones that are selling oil for the lamps. 
It's the churches that are selling oil for the lamps, metaphorically speaking, right? The churches are the ones that are preaching about Jesus. They're preaching about Christ. They're teaching about the light of the world. They're teaching about God. So notice that when the, the virgins, the five virgins run out of oil and the other girls tell them, okay, go to those who sell the oil or go to the, let's take this metaphor, go to the churches and get some oil. The five virgins decide, okay, that's a good idea. Let's go to the churches or let's go to the place that sells the oil, which are the churches or the fuel. And let's go, let's go get some fuel. But they're too late. I mean, they could have, think about it, the five virgins could have said, Wait, wait, I'm not going to go to those who buy the cell. I'm going to miss the bridegroom. I'm going to miss him. I'm going to stand here next to you. Hey, maybe I'll even help you hold the lamp up. I'm going to throw my lamp away. And I'll help you. I'll make a deal with you. I'll hold it up for half the night or 80% of the night. And you can rest and do what you want to do. But let me barter with you so I can stay here just in case the Lord returns. Because even though those places have fuel, while I'm going to get them, in the middle of the night, by the way, when the Lord comes to thief at night, I may miss him. Isn't that interesting? They could have said they, could have said they want to stay. You see that? They could have said, look, okay, if you really want to hold the lamps, I'll, I'll like be a seat for you and you can sit on top of me or something. You can, you know, I'll make a bench out of my body basically, right? And you can sit on me and I'll, be, I'll provide you some kind of service basically to wait with you just in case the bridegroom comes. Because by the way, remember, they heard the call. It's not like they didn't hear the call. They know his coming is imminent. He's coming very soon. They heard the call, for Christ's sake. It's not like they're waiting for an interminable period of time. They heard the call. The call has been made. Isn't that interesting? They could have decided not to go to the places that sell the fuel for, uh, for the lamps which become the light of the world or the light on the hilltop which is what and even Jesus in Matthew 5 talks about oil and lamps and hiding them under your bed does not anyone who has a lamp hide it under their bed no they hide they bring it out into the room so as to shed light that's in the same chapter as the chapter that he says he's the light of the world and you must become a light to the, unto this world. Matthew 5. So those five virgins could have taken a lesser position and served the ones who had the lamps they could have felt okay, they could have said, okay, all right, fine. If the bridegroom comes while I'm here waiting with this the other girls, I may have a lesser position, but at least I'll be in. At least I'll get in. I may have a lesser position. I may not be the top bride. I may not be the top of the brides of Christ or the head of the brides of Christ but at least I will be a bride 
I'm, in other words, I may not be the true mother, but I may, at least I'll be a bride of Christ. So I'd rather wait here with those who have enough oil because I heard the cry and I know it's nighttime and I know the coming is imminent. You see that they could have chosen that. But all of them decided to do what? They all decided to go to the places that sell the fuel, even though they heard the cry. They decided to take the advice and go to those who sell the fuel. And while they're on that journey, the bridegroom comes and he takes them in. But notice that he takes them in, but they were not far away because as the five are going to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrives, the virgins who were ready went in with him in the wedding banquet, the door was shut. I was, oh, the, no, 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 they were far away. Later, the others also came, Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replies, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. So it was just, later they come. Presumably they have now bought the oil. But it's too late. It's too late. They've missed the coming of Christ. Wow. Is there, and this is what the Bible says. It's like the kingdom of heaven. The, girl, the five of the girls miss the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Five of them miss the Messiah. They recognize him too late. Too late. And they can't come in. Notice that he's already alive. He's already big. He's already a man. He's already a bridegroom. He's already ready to get married, meaning that he's been here for quite a while. But he comes in the night. He gets The cry comes out at night. And the virgins, only five of them can recognize him. And of course, he has multiple brides. But the other ones, they come too late. And they miss entrance into the kingdom. Wow, how many, how many people in the body of Christ will miss entering the kingdom of God? Because they cannot accept that true father is a bridegroom. Think about it. It's a special type of prepared person or able type Christian that we call able type Christian or prepared Christian, prepared person in Christ who loves him and seeks him and waits and is come, waiting for his coming and is ready. There's a certain type of prepared person that enters into the, into the kingdom. Not all in the body of Christ will enter. Look at that. Not all will enter. Isn't that interesting? It's the preppers. It's the gun owners. It's the ones who are prepared. Prepared for the kingdom which is the kingdom ruled by the rod of iron. It is a masculine father-led kingdom. Christ is the father. Led kingdom. It is a kingdom with Christ the king, the general, Look at all the churches that have become so effeminate that are teaching a baby Jesus or a weak feminine Jesus. 
how will they enter the kingdom of the rod of iron? How unprepared are they? How totally unprepared they are. They have heard the cry of the coming of the Lord, but they will not be able to enter because they have not prepared. They have not been ready. The fuel is not there. And they can't admit that they're out of fuel, that they're burnt out, that they've run dry. Jesus said that he will come as a thief comes in the, in the night. No one knows the hour or the day. He said, no one. Of course, there are signs and wonders and there are hints and there are signs in heaven. Revelation 12, remember, signs in the heavens. The woman clothed in the sun, wrapped in the sun, moon at her feet, the garland or the crown of 12 stars. Fighting a serpent, Satan, who cast down a third of the stars of heaven. And then Revelation 12 and 5, she gives birth, she's pregnant, and she gives birth to a king who will rule the nations with a rod of iron. But of course, is that king is coming from a seed that is already within her, and a seed that comes from a father who wraps her as the sun and the moon and puts on her head a garland of 12 stars. So there will be signs and wonders when his kingdom is coming. But entrance to that kingdom will not last forever. Yes, God's kingdom will eventually take over the whole world, yes. But as you can see in the parable of the Ten Virgin, it doesn't begin that way. It begins with only five getting in. When Chaniguk begins, the whole world will not begin in Chaniguk or the kingdom of God. Many will lose the opportunity to enter in. You can potentially see many nations that will say, no, no, we don't want that. We like our socialism. We like our centralized government. We like our fascism. We like our dictatorships. We're not going to come in because we have to let the people become kings or co heirs with Christ, Romans 8 17. Or you may have those in the body of Christ that say, no, no, we can't accept that Reverend Moon is the return of Jesus. And that he had what they called the six marriages or whatever. He had too many brides. Well, Jesus has at least five brides when he returns. What will you say to Jesus? What will you say? Will you say, Jesus, you have too many brides. 
I thought you're the one who said that did he not make them male and female and, and, and let no man put us under what God has put together? That's your whole argument for marriage. Jesus, why do you have five brides? That's a little more than one, isn't it? <laughs> In other words, there will be something about Christ that is totally upending for many. They will have a hard time. He's supposed to be the faithful one. He's supposed to be the one who has fidelity. Yet he will not only take a bride of Christ as the church, he will take five brides. Crap. That really breaks the narrative, doesn't it? That really screws up the Christian narrative, doesn't it? That fights for husband and wife marriage, and of course, rightly so. It really screws up the narrative, though. Why didn't Christ just say he's going to have one bride? That would make a lot of things cleaner, wouldn't it? Why? Because the bridegroom is the greatest gift. It is the highest, highest, highest gift that he can give to the brides himself. Not because of egomaniac or megalomaniac. It's because he himself, as God, is the greatest gift that he can give to the bride. To the bride. And for only one bride to receive that, obviously, in Scripture, is not enough. He will give it to multiple brides. He will have multiple brides. He will share himself because he's the greatest prize. He's the greatest thing of value in the universe, beyond the universe as well. So he will share himself with multiple brides. If you're a Bible living Christian, even though that makes you feel weird and it makes you feel strange, you, you can't deny it. It is what the Bible says, and you do not get to decide. When we look at true fathers, multiple brides, we see that the brides fail him. They fail him. They're either trying to divorce him, they're beating him, they're becoming faithless, they're falling in love with other men. So father has multiple brides, not even in his own lifetime, when we see true father's course, it's not because, obviously it's not because of lust. These women are failing father. Because the purpose of the brides is to bear the fruit and to bear the lineage and bear the children. We'll have the lineage of God, but also be disciples. Which is the reason why in early Christianity, Christ, because he had no actual children who became his disciples, he had only spiritual children, which the Bible refers to as adopted sons. And so thus the kingdom of God could not come in the flesh, physically, because he only had spiritual children. So thus the spiritual kingdom could come, but not the physical kingdom. But when Christ returns... He will have physical children who will also who, who will become his disciples and will carry on his what? His kingship, his kingdom. And so thus that becomes the condition for what? The physical kingdom to come. But the physical kingdom comes on the condition of the children who are the disciples who love their physical father, who is Christ, as much as the disciples love Jesus, even though he was their spiritual father. And upon that foundation of both spiritual and physical lineage, 
God's spiritual kingdom, which comes in the physical, or as Matthew 6 says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, notice the kingdom has both a heavenly image and, and also an earthly manifestation. Heavenly manifestation and an earthly. See, the spirit has both heaven and earth as it is in heaven, right? Same. As it is in heaven, so too as on earth. Do you see? It has a dual nature, spirit and flesh, spirit and earthly. In the same way, the kingship of God or the kingdom of God is held, is started by the fruit who are both spiritually lineage, spiritual lineage, meaning they believe in Christ, they will die for Christ, but also they are physically his children. That is the fruit of the bridegrooms, the bride, do you see? That's why from the second king on, there's no need for this, for the bridegroom's position is already fulfilled, do you see? There's no need for now all the brides to be one with just the lineage. Or meaning that they have a bride position to the second king or third king or fourth king. See, there's, that, that, is, that is no longer there. That position is not inherited down. That's at the first king of kings. Because he's the king of kings. He's the bridegroom. The positions that are inherited down to his physical seed or physical fruit from the bridegroom, from the brides, with the bridegroom, are king and judge. Not bridegroom. Bridegroom stays at the first king of kings. And it's from the bridegroom and the bride that comes the lineage, which then becomes the substantial beginning point for both the spiritual kingdom and the physical kingdom to be manifest. That's why the position of the bridegroom does not pass on. And that's why I don't have five brides. You see, because that bridegroom position is already fulfilled. I am the fruit of that bridegroom position, uh, bridegroom and bride consummation. It's not only the spiritual mantle of God, the Father has placed upon me as his heir and successor, which he chose, not me, but also the physical mantle of his blood running through my veins and me being actually his flesh, while at the same time being his spiritual disciple, but also the physically being his actual flesh, his actual body, his actual, I am his actual flesh, his actual body. That, of course, Spiritually, I am in Christ, in Him. And of course, He has chosen me to be His heir and successor. On three different occasions, three different ceremonies, three times placing His crown on my head, three times making me king and judge, not bridegroom but king and judge. Those two positions of the king of kings get passed down through his physical body and flesh and his seed, right? His children who then become the second king, third king, fourth king, fifth king, etc. The position of king and judge get passed down and that's reflected in the constitution of the kingdom of God. The kings of the direct lineage of the kingdom uh, of the king of kings, of his chosen lineage, continue on in the constitution of being responsible for the king's position or the head of state position, and you know, meeting dignitaries, uh, leading ceremonies and 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 and, and rituals of the kingdom, etc., and judge being the sort of the final 
checkpoint of the Supreme Court, basically. So in the judicial realm, you see? So the, the bridegroom's position is unique to the first king, the first king, the king of kings, because he has established a nation from nothing. So he's established a peoples from nothing. And the peoples that not only are spiritually his children, but are also physically his children. And the spiritual children are led by the actual flesh that he's birthed, the actual presence of God that has been through him and that now continues through his kingship lineage. That's why there's a Cain and Abel relation between them. That's why the kings of the kingdom of God have the rights of kings, but again, they are tied together by God's kingship. One cannot relativize the position of the king within Chaniaguk. I'm not saying that the boast or anything, but you can't because that's the actual flesh and blood of the Messiah. That becomes the foundation for the actual kingdom of God to come and then becomes a foundation for actual kingship to be spread to the rest of the citizenry. Which is the reason why we all must also love the third king, protect him and cherish him. Of course, I as the second king, I'm raising him to be an honorable man and a good man, but at the same time, he does need that love and support. And recognizing that he's in a process of, he's the young boy still, and he's growing up. You know, so of course we're grateful for all the the folks and sanctuary folks who give him lots of space and don't try to crowd him and don't try to, you know, put additional pressure on already that he has. But our young kids, our young people, must realize that their one of their roles as kings and queens of China is to protect the king of kings' representative. That also is central to what it means to be a king in the kingdom of God, that you also pr protect the king of kings' bloodline. That you protect the king of kings' kingship, which, hold, which holds the endless, which will become the endless transmission or the endless physical presence of true father, the king of kings, on the, in, on the earth. And from which that center will exude the culture of the kingdom, the spirit of the kingdom. And that's why supporting, in our time, it's the second king and the third king, supporting the second king and raising the third king is very important. In the future, you know, it will be supporting the, you know, 50th king and raising the 51st king will be just as important in the same cultural tradition, the same fatherly tradition. as the king of kings. Do you see? Why did father have to walk that torturous, torturous path of the, quote, six Marys, or the, the many Marys, the many brides, the brides? That's such a painful path. Golly, think about it. It's such a painful path. When you're a young, dumb idiot, you think having all the girls in the world is a great thing. It, what a torch! What a torturous life that would be! What an absolutely torturous life that would be! I mean, being married to one woman is much easier, much better than having all these women who are betraying you and seeking power through you, and 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 who are fighting to get that position. And are betraying you and, and, and backstabbing you. And it's so much better just to have one bride who could do it. But obviously, there are failures. Those women were not able to succeed. 
including the Han mother. Which is why there had to be a wedding feast both in heaven and on earth, as Revelation chapter 20 says. There's a wedding feast. What do you think all the answers to liberations are? These are weddings. They're feasts in heaven. What do you think 923 and the true mother getting blessed to true father was, even though he's in heaven? What do you think? That it's the wedding feast in heaven. It's a wedding. That is happening both on heaven and on earth. See, the position of the bridegroom is the first king's responsibility to sort all that crap out with fallen women. Remember, they're all fallen women, by the way. With fallen, imperfect women so that his lineage and his kingship can be established, which will be the iron rod that will not perish. But to get that to be established is so dang hard because the brides have free will and they have their own thoughts and desires and ambitions and greed, etc. But when that bride, at least the head bride, the, what we call as a true mother, the head bride of the brides of Christ, when the head bride is firm and solid, and is perfected. Then, 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 folks, all things change. When finally there is the bride, there's five of them, right? There, there are many. There's going to be a favorite one. When there's that head bride that does not betray the Lord and does not, through her free will. It's victorious in serving the Lord, in, in, in loving the Lord, in never betraying the Lord, even though she loses everything. When that succeeds, everything changes. Everything changes. The game is now completely different. And then the kingdom of God can come. That's how critical the bride is. And that's how critical in understanding the bride groom's position, the torturous path of 10,000 crosses that is to walk because there's so many brides and they're all betraying him. They're all seeking through him just power and their licentious lusts. For, for authority, whatever it is, whatever they're seeking. But when that true mother is placed as the head of the brides, in the marriage feast in heaven and on earth, wow, and God's seed is present. His kingship line is already here, is here, it's present. All things change. And the kingdom of God is released, not only in heaven, but here on earth. It begins to be released. And now all the spiritual power of heaven is now organizing the actual kingdom to come together. You see, I don't inherit the bridegroom position from true father. That's already done, and that's already been fulfilled. The kings of the kingdom of God will inherit the, will inherit the kingly role and the legal judicial role, the judge's role, legally as the constitution of the kingdom of God delineates. But they will, not, they will not receive the bridegroom position or authority. Isn't that interesting? So when Christians ask, why does Reverend Moon have so many brides if he's the 
why did he have, you know, what our opponents called the six marriages? If he was the Lord's second advent. Well, read Matthew 25. Don't you know Jesus, when Jesus comes back, when Jesus returns, returning Jesus comes, he's going to have many brides? Why? Because they're imperfect. They are greedy. They are selfish. Why? Because they are they may, be, they may be prepared, but they have their own desires too. But there's of those five, there's going to be one that will be the head of the brides, that will be the loyal one, that will not try to usurp the position of the, consum, of the fruit of the bride and bridegroom, which are the children. And that bride will uplift the children, even though she feels that she has more authority than them as the mother, she will uplift the children to continue on the kingdom of their father. Wow, see, when that happened, all bets are off, all things change. Because the spirit of the father now has a place to dwell. The spirit of the father now remains in the subject position. And by the willing, free will acquiescence to the will of the Father by the bride, by the bride, an unending stream of victory comes because of that bride. Now an eternal stream of righteous women that will support the next king every generation will come because of the true mother who did such a thing for her king of kings, true father, and for his kingship on earth, the second king, who through that victory then was reborn and brought through true father's revelation the rod of iron. But do you see now how critical, critically important true mother's role was as the head of the brides? My God. Do you, I mean, do you see how critically important that was for history? Because now when the second king is getting old and about to die, the queen will have the image of the true mother who did what? Supported the sun, to rise to become the king. She will not be filled with greed and licentiousness. Say, I have the power, like the Han mother. She will, she will have as the archetype, as the victorious true mother, as the, as the symbolic and physical victory of women, as her ideal, she will have the archetype of the true mother Kong and what she did. And the queen and any fallen desires that she may have will be chased away by that archetype. And she will serve the third king as the true mother serves the second king. And this tradition of the, of the queen killing her desire to seek absolute power. Of course, which she can't anyways, but uh, the point is that desire to destroy it and to serve as the, as the willing, as a willing, freely chosen object to the king, to the next king, even though it's her son, even though in the physical she doesn't want to do that, but knows the archetype of the true mother. Every generation will have that standard by which they will be judged. Isn't that amazing? We talk about a standard, right? We talk about how will you judge good and evil unless you have a standard of goodness, which is God. How will you judge evil women versus good women unless you have a standard of the true woman? You see, 
So all the queens of Chenyuguk will be judged, especially in the kingship line, will be judged by the standard of the true mother. Not only in the eyes of men, but in the eyes of heaven. And they will receive either damnation, punishment, or reward from our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. That image, that standard, that ideal, that archetype has now been victorious, been set. The victorious bride, one amongst many, just like the Bible says in parable of the ten virgins, one amongst many brides, but is the one who is victorious to carry on the seed of Christ. And to be that queen which will serve the fruit of the bride and the bridegroom, the children, the bloodline, the lineage, the chosen child that will be the king of the kingdom of God. Protected by the kings, because it's the kingdom of kings, protected by the kings and the queens of the kingdom of God to stand in his anointing as the heir and successor and representative body of the King of Kings that lives through him in every generation.